Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Barker, founder of Connect Our Elders, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Rick Topetti. We actually go way back, um, I'm not even sure how many years, but I am very, very excited to be talking to him today. Rick, please share with the audience who you are, your role, what you do, and, and why you're doing what you do. Well, first of all, Sarah, thank you so much for the invite and being a part of this great show and what you're doing for the community. Um, yeah, I definitely have a why. I've been with Silverado going on 10 years. That will be official in late July. But really, my heart and focus, and I truly believe it's not a what, it's a why, is what we do every day. Not why, you know, not what you do, but why you do it. And years ago, I had one of my favorite aunts growing up um, who was stricken with dementia. And it was tough on my family, but I was very close to my first cousin. And I saw firsthand the stress and all of what that brought to him and his family, my, you know, his, you know, brothers, mm -hmm. sisters and whatnot. And I realized after seeing that happen and what they had to go through that I needed to be in a place in an industry where I could really make a difference, make an impact. And so for me, the pleasure and honor to serve seniors, to serve families, to serve my community partners over these past 10 years is really where my goal and focus is guiding families. And like I said, yes, I'm with Silverado and yes, I love what I do, but ultimately I just want families to have that peace of mind. And especially as we touch on things today, giving caregivers options to what they need to do to take care of themselves along that journey. So that's kind of where I'm at and I look forward to what's ahead. Aren't you always amazed that when a family gets referred to you, just how much they don't know, right? And that, and that's, that's not knocking the family. It's just that the maze of elder care options or for them to even know what's available is so much. And so if you're the person, so what I hear you saying is, I'm the person, I work for Silverado, but I am the person that is going to cast some light on this situation for the family. So they, so they know their options and they have some direction. So that's a really good point. I think for all of us in the industry, there's a lot of choice, a lot of great companies, a lot of great organizations. But as one individual, my goal and focus is how do I guide those families? And you touched on it. I've been very uh, fortunate, if you will, over the years. In my early part of my career at Silverado, I was what they define in the Silverado world, a family ambassador. I had a chance to work firsthand with the families. You know, you're sitting there in that moment, that wife, that person, that daughter, you know, being married 40, 50 years. There's a lot of emotions there and it's trying to understand where they're feeling it because they're trying to give all of what they had to that point. They want to be the good daughter, the good son, but you want to let them know we're here. We're going to guide you. If we're the right fit, great, but we're going to guide you. And that's always been my mantra over the years I've been with Silverado. I love that. I love that, Rick, because the majority of the time, right, the adult children and there's that psychological aspect of, I, I want to be a good daughter. I want to be a good son, but they don't know in that situation how, right, as the, as the family caregiver. So what you're telling them is, let me support you. Like you be the son or daughter and let me give you the information and the guidance so that way you, you can be confident <laughs> that you are being a good son or daughter. Well, you're absolutely right about that too. And, you know, I think a lot of times, and I've seen this over the years, they come in, they're tired, they're exhausted, but they're like, I'm the only option for mom. I'm the only option for dad. This is my husband. This is my life partner or vice versa. <laughs> hey, look, that's big time stuff. I mean, I've been married 23 years. I can't imagine what some of these people when they come in at 58 years, but I always say too, along those lines, you've got to put a kind arm around you because you say to your, well, I got to take care of my spouse, but who else are you letting down? What other relationships in your life are suffering? You know, uh, what toll is it taking on your health? You know, you know, you're going to need medical help at some point. And in some cases, the caregiver gets sick before their loved one who may have a Parkinson or another disease. So you need to put an arm around you and take care of you. So you have that balance, you know, as a caregiver moving forward. It's the whole concept of the airlines, right? Put your mask on before you put somebody else's mask on, right? Because how are you supposed to care? for your loved one if you're not taking care of yourself, right? That's a really good point. And that's really what we share with families because sometimes families come in or they'll reach out and they're thinking about it. And if it's the right time and the right fit. And, you know, we always say, you know, what does ready look like? You know, wherever that community might be or whatever that next step is. But the first thing you need to do in the process, whether or not 
you know, you're a caregiver now on the very front end, your mom or your dad, your loved one's been diagnosed, maybe communities a few months or, you know, years down the line, I don't know. What are you doing for yourself? Those are the things I look at because I think sometimes caregivers, they expect they're going to have this positive effect. Well, I'm going to take care of mom and I'm going to be Wonder Woman or I'm going to be Superman. But because they feel that way at times, respect to them, it's unrealistic because if they have Parkinson's or a dementia diagnosis, sometimes things fall out of the realm of their control. Yeah. And you're really trying to hang on. So we're like, look, again, things are going to go in a direction, but you got to evaluate your options for you so you can be the best to them, but also to your children and to the other people you love you, to your employers and whoever else is part of your life, your spouse, if it is, you know, another loved one. That, that is beautifully said. So before uh, we progress into asking you, I want to ask you some specific questions. Um, hmm. Would you please share? So you've mentioned Silverado. What What, what is Silverado? Well, it's, I mean, maybe I'm partial, been her 10 years. Um, Lauren Shook, our president and CEO and founder, along with Steve Winter and God rest his soul, Jim Smith, started an amazing company concept back in 1996. Um, in fact, the Escondido community, to which is one of my communities, I also have Encinitas down in San Diego, California. Uh, the concept really was brought forth, love is greater than fear. But what do we do every day to celebrate people? And people ask me, Rick, you've been there 10 years. And I say, well, yeah, I have. But it's the core philosophy that Lauren has built and what we have built as a memory care community from early on since to late stage. And again, Sarah, I'll say this, there's a lot of great, beautiful communities out there and we're all here as one to serve those with need. But I'll say this representing Silverado, I'm so proud of the model that we have every day because when I first walked in to Silverado 10 years ago, I remember, I remember the ladies, they took me for a tour and they were making like these little flower arrangements and they were smiling and they were laughing. And it just made me think back to my aunt, but it made me think about, wow, to represent something along those lines like this. Lauren and the team across the country has done such an amazing job bringing that philosophy of let's celebrate their abilities. Let's not focus on their limitations. Let's go kayaking. Let's go have a glass of wine at a winery. Let's go down to the beach. Let's go take that walk. Let's embrace things. Let's do Zumba through our programs, our Nexus program. And to me, it's about giving them purpose every day. So when you ask, what does Silverado do? It really is about giving them life every day. And I think for me, as I sit here today- Oh my gosh, you, it's so beautiful. I have goosebumps, Rick. <laughs> That is so beautiful. And I, that's the first time I've, you know, that you've told me this, right? But so what you're saying is that that is the philosophy behind Silverado memory care, right? Or their, their whole organization is that they're giving elders life and purpose every single day. You hit, you hit the nail on the head and you know what, Sarah, along those lines. And I, again, I, I've always been a guy that when I'm behind something, I'm passionate. It's behind who I am, but I will say this as I sit here with you. And as I look at my life going forward, really the heart and soul, greatest respect, especially over this last year, we've all had to deal with COVID our heroes, our caregivers, and not just our Silverado caregivers, but caregivers across the country their heart and soul and sacrifice. They are the true Wonder Woman, uh, Superman. They make my job, and I get goosebumps saying it to you, they are my why because the love, the care they give the residents. And for me, especially at Silverado, I see it every day. I saw it through COVID. I saw it through the journey. I saw it as we're going forward. So I look at every story when they come in. I had a uh, referral come in this morning. They called me up, one of my community partners, and, we have a situation, family, better suited for Silverado. I said, we will put our arms around the wife. We will put our arms around the daughter in support of the husband. And to me, whether or not they're with us for two months, two years, and we've had some residents with us eight, nine years, we want to put a smile on their face, but also give peace of mind to the family. And as we go forward, being able to celebrate, not great, we've got this, we'll see you in a month, come in, let's do things together, not to get off track, but doing some of the things we do within the community so you can spend that quality of time with your loved one. So what I hear you saying is that when somebody comes into one of your communities, it's not, oh, 
we have this person with a cognitive deficiency, right? Alzheimer's, dementia, right? It, it's, hey, they're coming into this community and we're going to celebrate every day of their life until the end. You know, Sarah, I know it may sound a little corny, but it's the absolute truth. And to <laughs> that end, um, I'll tell you, when I look at our engagement directors, when I look at our incredible nursing team, when I look at the fearless leaders of our communities, especially my local ones here in San Diego, uh, California, uh, both Maravell and Kelly, I, I feel very honored and blessed to work for them with their vision. But it's every Silverado, to your point, you and I could get on a plane, go to Wisconsin. We could jump back on a plane and go to Belmont and then get back on a plane and go back to Chicago or go to our beautiful community up in Washington and Bellingham and, and, and see all the communities up there and see and feel the same thing. So, so I didn't even realize, I, I did not realize that Silverado had that much of a reach, right? I, I thought Silverado was a San Diego based company, but so, so they have other locations. Well, yeah. And they're continuing to grow. But what I like about Silverado, when Lauren and the executive team looks at where they want to go, they look at, is this the right fit for us? Is this the right area for us to be? Can we make an impact? I certainly think we can make an impact just about anywhere, but I like the way they've done it as they continue to grow methodically, uh, but with a, with a quiet focus. And, you know, kind of going back to what I was saying to you earlier, I think for me, I just, I'll tell you, I was telling my wife the other day, I go, I wake up sometime and pinch myself, Sarah, and go, wow, I've got great, great, amazing partners. I represent, in my opinion, one of the best companies in memory care. But again, not to sound like an infomercial, it's really about my passion to serve seniors, mm -hmm. but also at the same time, making sure the caregivers, the people that work within our communities, as well as those out there know there's a pathway. You just got to find that pathway for you so you can get where you need to be to support your loved one. Uh, absolutely. Because everybody's pathway is different. Thank you so much, Rick. So let's let's move into the questions I'd like to ask you. What do you say to the caregiver that says, I don't have time for me, but I'm the only one who can take care of mom? That's a tough one. That's a real emotional, tough question. And, you know, I, I try to understand the relationship. Like, obviously, you love your mom. You you love your, your dad. You love your, your spouse, you know, but kind of touching on what I said earlier, you love them. And yes, that's important. You want to guide them down the path. But what other areas in your life are going to suffer because you're giving all of what you have? It's kind of like the giving tree. Your heart and soul is there. And that's important. And you love them. But you have to be in a place where you put an arm around you and you need to take care of yourself. You touched on it earlier, eloquently said, sir, when you talked about the oxygen mask. If we're on a plane, God forbid, we need to make sure that our child has that mask, right? But before we do that, we got to put it on ourselves or they're never going to see that mask. It's the same thing with our loved ones. And in doing those things, I share with families, what are you doing right now for you? Well, I need to be there for mom. I'm doing this. But the impact can take them down a path where their health will be challenged and the quality of life will go down a very not so good road and they need to just, they need to nurture themselves. And I think a lot of what happens is there's a lot of conflicting emotions mm -hmm. they're dealing with. So I try to ask them, what are you doing for you? And then I use that as a building block. What are things you like to do? I'll stop mm -hmm. for a moment if you have a thought, but I can certainly can keep going, but no, right. So asking, right. The adult child who is being the family caregiver, what, what are you doing for you to take care of you? So that way you can continue to be there to care for mom, right? Or maybe what are your options? Do you just want to be the daughter again and not the caregiver? So let's talk about how we can accomplish that. Sir, that's a really good point. I think a lot of times too, I share with families when you dig in a little bit deeper, looking at the situation. Now you and I can sit here and go, okay, what are some things we can do? What do you like to do? Well, I love yoga. Great. Let's pull out that yoga mat. Let's try to find that time in the morning or at night when you have you time. We all need it, but especially if you're a caregiver. We look at the statistics right now. I think it was 18% of Americans that, that do have a loved one with dementia back in 2015. 
uh, now, six years later, the percentages have gone up to like 25% where they're now taking care of more than one family member. So you need to put an arm around you. But what does that look like? Looking at different things, looking at not just the yoga, but how are you eating? Are you taking care of you, right? Proactively planning meals, proactively making sure that you're doing the things that you need to do positioning yourself. And you touched on something earlier, Sarah, really good point. I truly believe too, that a lot of times family members and granted, I understand out there's a lot of individuals that have loved ones and I'm in California, my sister's in Virginia. And I understand, but it's looking at your cycle, looking at your resources around you where you can utilize family, where you can reach out, whatever that dynamic is, whether or not you have a call once a week via Zoom with your two sisters, your brother, a loved one. Sometimes we wanna be Superman. I'm the good son and I can go back in time with my cousin. He had two brothers. Nope. He wanted to just do it all. And I saw it taking him down. He finally started to let family in. So as I say this to you, I say it from the heart, love your family, let them help love you. So you could have that balance to be the best caregiver you can be to your loved one. Whether or not you're ready to play someone tomorrow, you need to take care of you. You need to focus on you. So absolutely. And I'm going to deviate from the line of questions because something just came to mind. Can you address or talk to the experience that these adult children typically have when it comes to guilt, which sort of drives this whole, I've got to do it all. I, I've, you know, and, and the, the martyr sort of situation, how can you, how can you coach, right? These adult children who are trying to care for their loved one and help them work through the guilt of, because I I've noticed with the adult children, when it gets to a point where really placement is the right option, right? That they're experiencing this immense guilt of over making that decision. Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I think along the lines of really what my goal and focus has been when I've had the opportunity to talk to family members. I recently had a conversation with the son. Mom and dad been married 65 years and he broke down crying on the phone. And um, and I'm a son. You know, I have, uh, you know, two parents, uh, one remarried, wonderful family. My dad's 85, mom's 88, uh, sandwich generation, have a daughter in college, you know, so um, I asked him and I just said, let's just say his name was John. I said, John, you know, tell me about your relationship with your father and what is most important, not with your father, but what was your relationship growing up with your mom? I try to understand what the relationship was because sometimes you find, and you touched on it, well, you know, she was sometimes verbally abusive or there was this or that or very controlling. So later in life now, you want to do it right, just like we've done in relationships and make that now. Well, I couldn't fix that but I can fix this now and give of myself and do anything and everything I can. This is so deep. This is so deep, Rick. And I think that like we, we should do another show where we just talk about that thing. Right. So when I got into the industry and I would have the interactions with families and, and I, I would get frustrated, right? Like I admit I was bringing judgment to the situation and I'm like, why, why doesn't this son or daughter care about their mom or dad? Right. But over the years, I realized, number one, not my job to be the judge. Number two, I have no idea what their experience was with their parent, right? And how they might be feeling right now that they're being called to care for their parent when when maybe the parent wasn't so caring for them as a child, right? So there is all of this deep emotional uh, dynamics to these situations. Sarah, you hit the nail on the head. I, I, I think for all of us in the industry, for all of us to do what we do, being a caregiver, love one at home, or now I've got a place. I've always tried to ask, certainly I've had the conversation most recently with the son, broke down crying a little bit on the phone. He says, I just want what's right for my mom and I want my dad to have peace. And I said, I understand it is hard being in this situation, but what is most important to you as things go forward in the care of your loved one? What do you, what is the outcome that you want? What does that look like? And then I try to go down a path with them and we all try to go down a gentle path. If you knew your mom was warm and safe or your loved one or your wife or your spouse, how would that impact you both physically and mentally? Well, I don't know if I can do that. Let's pretend for a moment. Let's say you did. 
What would that allow you to do? And it's interesting, Sarah, sometimes they'll come back and go, well, I, I do have a couple of friends. I had a car club back in the 50s and they're always asking me to go golfing and I never can because I'm taking care of Margaret. Well, okay, but then I think I'm not a good husband. No, wait, John, you are a good husband. You want her to be in the right place with her arms around her to give her health and well-being. That doesn't make you a bad husband. That makes you one that says, I love her. And sometimes releasing control is the very foundation of accepting what's next in being able to give them the highest level of care, wherever that community may be. Absolutely. So one of our audience members, um, a friend of mine, Brian Paul, he said, yes, right. He's listening to this right now. And he said, balance is of utmost importance, right? So you just described the situation, right? Where there's a husband, wife has dementia, struggling with the guilt of, oh, well, I used to do this, but I can't do these things anymore. So making sure that he has resources so that way he, or if it's the wife, right, can maintain some sort of balance to their life so they can show up better in their care and support of their loved one. Well, Sarah, again, you're right on. And I've always said, whatever community you go to, and we'll talk about some other resources I'll suggest at the end of this, but I'm always one, when you look at everything, first and foremost, you got to put a kind arm around you. So what does that look like? Again, I love to run. Great. Taking that little hike, looking at your family resources where you can. And I know it's not easy for everybody, but looking at those resources, staying connected to your family, whether or not that's through Zoom, I call my sister every Tuesday at three, or I do a, a conference call, whatever it is that brings joy into your heart, bringing that balance for you time. You've got to be able to do that because I think when you're able to focus on you and you're able to do that, not only is it going to allow you to be there and present for your, your loved one, but also productive in other areas of your life. So you have that bit of balance versus I've got to be Superman. I've got to do it all. And when you do that, like a candle, it's going to continue to go down and down and down until there's nothing left. And then you can't give nothing to anybody. So I think for, in my philosophy, certainly Silverado's and I'm sure many other lovely communities, it's understanding where are they in their journey for their loved one. And of course, if as things play, because, you know, communities can be expensive. Yes, you do what you do, but taking care of yourself along the way so you can have that support system in play, you know, and, I, you know, not to go off target, but I also mentioned to people too, like, you know, looking at support groups through your churches, um, looking at how those resources can bring value, maybe mm -hmm. meeting other individuals mm -hmm. that are also going through it. Oh, you're a son too? Yeah, my mom was diagnosed. Oh, it was my dad. Oh my gosh, maybe going and having a coffee. Just the nurturing communication with other people, getting them out of their shell. So know, they don't build. feel alone, right? They don't feel alone, that they're the only ones struggling with this or going through it, right? But, but engaging, right? Engaging and, and social activity is important. For, for their health as the family caregiver. Again, you're absolutely right about that. So I always try to encourage people, have the balance, be good to yourself, because it's like taking our vitamins. Got to take our vitamins, don't want to get sick, get your rest, if you're sleeping three hours a night, it's not going to be good. You've got to look at your overall model. I'm not saying there's not challenges out there, but digging deep and looking at where those resources can assist you going forward. I love that, Rick. Oh, we have another comment. So my oh. friend, Mike Nally, he actually represents a company called Smart Care. Mm. Um, so they, they provide software to non-medical home care companies. I'm telling you, it's an industry disruptor when it comes to that, because most people use clear care, but this software is amazing. Uh, anyway, so uh, he said, great interview, Sarah and Rick. I love the focus on uncovering the deeper needs of the family, the need behind the need. Well, first of all, thank, thank you, Mike. Um, uh, you know, I, I'll tell you, I, uh, I truly believe for all of us that do this, you need to be self-aware and very present in these moments. And I think this is my heart. This is my passion every day. But I think when you put yourself in the shoes of what they're going through every day, you think about everything, you see everything. And I think for us, what do we do along those lines? And that's kind of really how, which drives my passion, looking at where there's frustration. Why do you feel that? Where is that coming from? What was that relationship? And how do we navigate it through? Because it's okay. You can be a daughter again. You can be a son again. Release that guilt because 
there's the sun will shine again and you're going to have a better relationship on the other side of it moving forward to again, to be able to celebrate them where you're not able to do that potentially now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Next question. In your experience, how important is it for the caregiver to have a plan and support system in place for themselves? So we've kind of already touched on that, but go ahead um, if you don't mind and answer that. No, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very important item for every caregiver out there. And God bless all of you out there, all you angels that take care of loved ones and what you do. There's no words for all of you. You're all truly heroes. Um, I think it is important. I think that you need to, again, we talked about having a plan from a perspective of health. Yes. What am I doing to nurture me? Take care of me, um, getting enough rest, getting exercise. Great. Doing all that. But it's also planning from a medical perspective making sure if you are taking care of your loved one, making sure you have all their medical information, have everything proactive. Needless to say, I'm sure most of them go along the, go along with them, accompany them on appointments, understand where they are in the process in your communication with the doctor. How do you see this Dr. Smith? Where do you see this going? And understanding what resources can be available to you as you communicate with those people. I think it's also something too, and this is something we found over the years too with caregivers, is if you have a loved one at home that you're taking care of, if there is a medical device or something that is pertinent for them to have, whatever that device is, that you're in communication with the electric company and the fire department to make sure ahead of time, if there's a power outage, things like that. So when we talk about plan, we talk about proactively making sure what if this happens? What if the power goes out? We consider and talk about food, yes, and support system. And, you know, okay, if this happens or if I got to take care of this with my wife or my daughter and something happens with my mom, who is the person that's going to be the next in line to do whatever? So if we are proactive in having those things in play, it's going to reduce our stress, simplify as much as it can, but also give peace of mind that you have a plan in place. To a plan you. and a contingency plan and a contingency plan after that. And I'm a big proponent. So everything that you're talking about right now, right, is looking at the loved one, whether you're the family member or you're a service provider in a holistic approach. I mean, that term gets thrown around all the time. Oh, holistic care, holistic care. But what, what does that mean? And I feel like you're describing that, right? Okay, food, safe, uh, you know, making sure there's not fall hazards or, you know, all of that stuff, but also do they have their affairs in order, right? Do they have an estate plan? Is the home in a trust to make sure they avoid probate? Like wh what is the plan? Okay. Mom or dad is staying home right now, but what are we going to do when maybe that's not a possibility? So I always tell families, there's nothing wrong with getting education, right? Okay, fine. You you don't want to put your mom in a memory care right now. That's okay. But there's no reason why you shouldn't learn about that option right now. So that way, when the time comes, you're familiar with what you're going to do, right? You, you've already gone. You've already developed the report. You feel comfortable. So it's going to be a much less stressful decision and transition. I couldn't have said it better, Sarah. You're absolutely right about that. I think it's so important when you look at all the dynamics of what can be, uh, you know, elder law attorneys, having your resources available to reach out to. Um, and certainly there's some sites to look at too for these, um, you know, having the healthcare directive in place, the financial director, you know, as a son or a daughter or a loved one, durable power of attorney. So all of that is in play in trust. So when something does happen, maybe it's not ready for them to move in tomorrow, but when it does, you have everything in play and we find with families it might go, oh my gosh, we're in crisis, but I'm feeling the emotions and we're going to guide you through those emotions. We're going to hold your hand through this, Sarah. Great. But you have your other affairs in play. You're going to have that peace of mind. So to your very good point, it's not going to be proactive or be reactive. It's proactive that you have these things in play. Such a critical point. And I, that's one thing that we certainly share with families. Definitely. And that's sort of the whole intention behind Connect for Elders, right, is to provide education, start learning about your options sooner rather than later. You know, it's it's it benefits your aging loved one. It benefits you, too. Right. As far as stress level. Um, OK, great. Uh, third question now. What are some things caregivers can do for themselves as it relates to self-care to manage the day to day and minimize burnout? Well, yeah, I, I think kind of 
touching what we said earlier, I, and, I, and I really, I can't emphasize it enough because I share it with our caregivers within our communities, um, certainly in the dynamics of family members over the years, uh, and certainly to those we've spoken to. Um, the number one thing that you need to do is you've got to figure out what is it that lights you up inside and whatever that is, you need to do that um, on a daily basis somewhere. You can't have 12 hour days um, or hours on end being the caregiver and then also trying to work and or also being a spouse. So, you know, the first thing I, I talk about is the things we spoke to eating healthy. So critical. You know, I'm not saying everyone's going to follow the 13 superfood groups and eat spinach <laughs> and broccoli every day. Um, but eating healthy, being conscientious of what you're putting in your body and how that's affecting you, because there's going to be different levels of stress and you've got different types of personalities out there. You know, the person that's like the doer, you know, the, the, you know, they're very focused on detail and organization. They might deal with things differently when it relates to stress because they want to be the perfect son or daughter. Know who you are and really in that, what are the things you're going to put in your world to position you for success? So, for example, for me, I love to go out with hikes with my wife and or my daughter, get out, get fresh air. So even as much as I embrace the world I'm in every day, I love at least once a week going out and taking a three, four mile hike, getting outdoors. My wife and I like to go out and maybe do a picnic or something and just get outside. So maybe put your headset on, listen to some very soothing music, whatever that might be. Um, you know, set time aside too socially. I know we've had COVID, but now we're going forward. You know, go have a glass of wine, go have a coffee, find that time for yourself. The other thing that I will say, and you touched on this also earlier, Sarah, which is that was a really good point. When you talk about education, the other thing that I, I talk about with families is you need to be able to also understand better ways to communicate with your loved one, because you can say, oh, my gosh, every time I tell my mom, she just doesn't listen or my husband just does da 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 and it drives me nuts. Yes, he has those moments because he has a disease, a progressive disease. But what can you do from an educational perspective? So looking at your resources that are out there, and again, when we're done, I'll give you a couple of sites that people can look at that talks about how you can manage stress, but also looking at those resources that will allow you to be able to better understand when mom says, well, I want, I'm, I'm supposed to go to the doctor today. It's like, oh, mom, you know, the doctor's appointment is gonna happen tomorrow. They call this versus no, mom, you have it wrong. It's the little moments and I, oh, there is so much we could talk about. <laughs> um, right. So the, the concept of it is a disease, like your mom and dad, mom or dad, husband, wife, right. That, that has dementia, Alzheimer's. They're not meaning to annoy you, right. <laughs> there, it, it is truly a disease. And so accepting it, and then meeting them where they are, right? And understand that they can no longer be in your reality. So it's necessary for you to learn the coping skills on how you can now step into their reality. And Sarah eloquently said, and the thing that I find with individuals that come in, maybe they're looking at it is the next step and the guilt and all that. But because there's so much frustration and energy, you know, some of these people married 40, 50 years and, oh, John just never, or Bob never listened. And it's like, well, we need to reframe how we communicate. I've always been a believer, and this applies to all of us in life, both personally and professionally. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. So if you look him in the eye, you smile, you're here, you're gentle in the voice versus, Bob, you're not listening. You know, they have what they have. And then I always say to them, what would Bob or what would Margaret say to you if you were looking at considering a community where that might be, what would they say to you now, knowing that you're looking out for their best interests? That's powerful. What, what would they say? That, that is a very powerful question to be asking families, right? Because asking them that question, Rick, you're giving them permission, right? To, to admit or, or to even think about it, right? Hey, you know what? Bob, Bob would probably be okay. Like Bob, Bob would tell me to do this. Yeah. And I, I just say, that's what this is. They would say, I love you. I appreciate you. I know this has got to be the hardest decision of your life, our life. And even though I can't look you in the eye right now in the realm of what this disease has done to me, I am here for you and appreciate you. And I stop and only for them to see it from the other side of what you just articulated very well. Absolutely. Okay. Number four. Yep. 
as we are slowly and cautiously coming out of COVID, <laughs> what would your message be to families who are dealing with burnout, but know it's time to do what's best for their spouse? I think the biggest thing that we are doing, what we all as a country are trying to do in this industry, and I think certainly the core philosophy behind Silverado is gently put our arms around them. Um, because, you know, sure, I could sit here and go, well, we're hitting 24 years or 20. That's all nice. We've been here a long time. Great. We do what we do. But to me, it's I want them to know that we are here for them. We want to put our arms around them. We want to understand their feelings. What's going on for them? How is this experience? What has this been like for you? What are you experiencing now? Tell me about your loved one and let's see how we can guide you down a path that's going to give peace of mind to you and the rest of your family and then let them emote. And to your point, Sarah, a lot of times you'll sit there with the family. I know my family ambassadors do this all the time and they might sit there for an hour, emote emotions. There could be tears. There's, oh my gosh, we were married 38 years. We had a business and this. And so I really think the message is we are moving forward. Everything that we are doing as we come post COVID with all the appropriate protocols and respect to people. I'm not here to get political, but certainly in our community environment and what we do, we said, you know, our people have the vaccination. Great. We're here to serve. We want them to have that peace of mind if they bring their loved one in. And we certainly get more granular when they come in. Mm -hmm. But I think the most important thing for families is when they do go and evaluate a community that they feel that that community can serve their loved one, but they also feel a sense of connection when they walk in. I'm, yeah, go ahead. What would you say? So, right, being in the industry, right. there was a lot of people that were maybe considering putting their, their loved one, whether it's a parent or spouse, right? right. Held off, held right. off on making the transition into a community um, out of fear or, you know, just the the knowing that when they all locked down, right, they couldn't see their loved one. So, so what would you say to them now? Um, because things, things are different, right? We're coming out of it. Yeah. So, so what do you think that they need to understand about it's, it's okay now to take that step? It, it's safe, right? Yeah, that's really, I'm glad you said that. I, I think we're starting to find, especially over the last month and a half, two months, People are kind of gently coming in. Okay, I love my husband. I love my wife, but I know it's time. They've had him at home. Some of them were ready to place last year. And then we talk about burnout and the stress of COVID, not wanting to go out, not wanting them to get COVID or whatever. It took a toll on a lot of people. So I think what we're finding now is, and really what we're sharing with families is, we are here. We are here to serve you. It is okay. We are going to do everything at the highest level. And then we'll sit there and go question by question. Tell me about your community. What are you doing with COVID now? What about this? What about that? High level things all the way to give them that peace of mind. And we're noticing that families, I think they're starting to realize, okay, yeah, I think my loved one could do good things here celebrating their life. And I want to be a part of it, even though they have the disease, I still want to celebrate them because that's what I say to them. What's the alternative? You're at home. You're, you're emotionally draining yourself. You're not able to be that wife. You're not able to be that husband. You're an amazing wife. You're an amazing person, but you deserve to be the best version of you in serving your husband and or your spouse. And I really bring that home when I share that with them. And I'm, I think we're finding that, now that people are starting to look at it, they're getting that level of peace of mind. And we just recently had a family come into the community and they shared with us, oh my gosh, it's so great to see my spouse doing so much better. I said, great. We're so happy that we could do this, but how are you doing? How are you doing? And they got emotional in a good way. I didn't realize the emotional burden it was doing to me and my two grown children. They had like children in their late twenties. And, and now I get to be that much more of a mother to them, but still a wife to my husband. And again, Sarah, whether or not they pick Silverado or another community, that is the emotion that I want to see in those families. And I always say, if you find the right place or we help to guide you or give you a thought that guided you with peace of mind, yay. But the, 
what's the alternative? Because I say, and I'll, I'll finish it with this. You don't want to be in a place where they got to go 5150 to the ER. And now you're dealing with all of that. And I just pray to those families before that happens, look at your options, look inside of your heart and know we're here. It's so important. I preach this all the time. Elder care resources should be proactive, right? Like try to, I, so any families watching right now, right? Or when you, when you watch the recording of this, I encourage you, there's no harm in getting educated on what your options are, what the resources are. So that way you're not, you know, trying to do all of this in a crisis. It's just so much more stressful that way. Right. Um, and then also what I wanted to say, so I tell me if you have the same experience, please, that when you, when you talk to families, and everything that you're saying right now is that you're painting the picture for them because, because the truth of the matter is they don't know, like they don't know what it would look like if they were to implement a resource or make the decision to have their loved one go to memory care. Right. Or they don't know what it looks like. And so that's why there's such a need for people like you, Rick, who can paint the picture for them. <laughs> We, we really, you realize, like you said, Sarah, in the moment, the emotions that are there, because when they come into a community environment or even evaluating it, you have to be aware of where are they. And we always say in our Silverado family, you got to meet them where they're at and then guide them to ultimately what's going to bring peace of mind and support to their family. And then the highest level of care, hopefully that will be delivered, whether or not it's Silverado or another community, but that's certainly the mindset, you know, of what we bring. But, you know, I always say when we'll have a dialogue with the family and we have different links on the Silverado site um, that when you go to Silverado Memory Care and you can just Google us and then our beautiful site will come up and we have multiple communities um, that you want to have that peace of mind that wherever you put your loved one that, yeah, they're good, they're warm, they're safe. Um, and, the, and, the, and the team is doing the right things. And I think for me, and, and you know, we touched on as I feel blessed to go on 10 years at Silverado in July, got caregivers that have been there 19 years. We have one of our nurses, wow. old nurse, one of our communities, 23 years, um, 10 years, 14 years. What does that mean? That means these people in their heart and passion and purpose to do what they do, they believe in the model. I, I'm certainly sure there's other amazing communities that have the same story, but this is my story. And I've always been a believer in life. You know, you can build a castle in the sky, but you have to have a foundation underneath. And I think for me, that's kind of the mindset I've always had, you know, at Silverado and not to go off track is I'm here to answer any questions, but there's always a quote that's always stayed in me. I'll paraphrase it. And those of you out there that might be watching this or will watch it, know me because you've seen it through my trainings. It's kind of goes along these lines from George Bernard Shaw. And it's basically along the lines of, Upon my death, upon my last day, I want to be thoroughly used up like a candle, thrown upon the scrap heap, knowing I gave everything of my heart and soul to this world, and knowing before I close my eyes for the last time that everything and ounce of my heart was given upon those that I was able to serve. Then I can say wow. goodbye forever. And I don't mean to be a poet. I don't mean to. I just, that's my life. That's my mantra. That's what I will say. Oh my goodness. You need to send that to me. <laughs> when we end this, I need you to email or message that to me. So I have that. That is incredibly moving. Um, what would you say? So I, I find that sometimes the barrier to um, someone putting their loved one in a community is they have this um, idea that their loved one is just going to go there and be sitting all alone, or maybe the whole visual of, oh, my loved one's just going to be sitting in a wheelchair slumped over in the halls of this place. Well, you, you had a good point. And unfortunately, there is select places out there in the world. <laughs> we'll leave it at that, that unfortunately, those are the environments which aren't very forwarding for the individual. Um, I think that's very important when families go out and evaluate that they come at different times to see what does that community look like? you know, to see, okay, what does it really look like? Mm -hmm. Granted, nine o'clock on a Friday night might look differently, but if you go there at two o'clock on a Thursday, and let's say you did a tour at 10 o'clock on a Wednesday, what does it look like at two o'clock on a Wednesday or a Thursday? Is it just doors closed, no activity? 
that says something because I think it's important for all communities, especially certainly in the Silverado model, to understand each individual, which is what Silverado does. Mm -hmm. We want to know who were they, who are they? Mm -hmm. I'll give you a great story. And some of you out there might know this story from years ago, but it's one of my favorites and one of my favorite stories of all time. Uh, one of our San Diego communities, I had in Escondido, uh, a gentleman years ago, I was about two years into my journey at Silverado. And um, the wife came in, God bless her, um, Sarah. Her name was Sarah, actually. Uh, so I say Sarah. And uh, so she came in, she was crying. She had heard about Silverado. And she goes, um, I don't know what else to do. I don't know where else to go. Uh, my husband, his name was Richard, was asked to leave three communities. I don't know where, where else to go. I go, well, okay, we're here. Let's have some water, sit down. Team put our arms around her. We said, well, tell us about your husband. I said, well, he was a Vietnam vet. God bless him for serving our country. Uh, okay, came back after that, was a police officer. Wow, God bless him, continued to serve, wonderful. I said, well, what did he do in later years? And at this point, he's in his early 70s. Well, he uh, went on to become a senior director of the FBI on a national level. And I went, whoa, like, like dun, 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 the FBI, like this man was big time, which I would get to know through pictures and everything else. I said, well, I said, okay. So as I share this with you, this really defines this, the purpose of Silverado. So our team, and these stories are, we can have hundreds of stories across the country. We got together, got him a hat, said FBI in white letters, Got him a badge. Our director of maintenance said director of security. So we had to channel his energy, we had a walker. So we go, Richard, we need you to become director of security for Silverado. I want you to keep your eyes wide when people come in. Make sure everything's okay. He uh. said, We're, got up. I'm going to take care of this whole 1,800 hours. I'm going to be up ready to go. What we did is we gave him purpose. But what we did was give him hope that there was something still there to give back to others. So all the families. Because that's what had driven him his whole life, right? Eloquently said, Sarah. <laughs> so families would come in. He put his arm out. Who's this? Not all the time, but every family member knew. That was Richard. Hello, Richard. I'm here to see Margaret. Hi, Richard. I'm here to see. And you know why they embraced it? Because the very foundation of what we did with Richard was the very foundation we would do with their loved one because every individual has a story. So fast forward, Sarah. Oh. Richard would go on the next two years to do security rounds. When I worked on Fridays as a family ambassador, he would sit at the table, he'd have his sandwich and his Diet Coke. And then I go, how are we doing today, Richard? I'm doing good, but I got it ready. I got to go take care of my Corvette, but then I got to go do rounds. He would get up to his rounds, come back, sit down. He would sit down for a good part of the afternoon, engage in different activities. Point is, it was all there. We celebrated him uh, thereafter, Memorial Days, Wall of Honor, all of that as a man of stature. But his story reigned true. And even though he passed away a couple of years ago, God rest his beautiful soul. And it was I, I loved Richard and his family. It's the story of these stories across the country that we do that goes to your point about purpose. Because you're right, Sarah. They can come in. Great. Here's Silverado. Well, you're a little more expensive. You're this. We are what we are. But I'll say this. We will do everything in our heart and soul and power to celebrate your loved one, put our arms around it with our heroes, our caregivers every day. There'll never be a day that we will waver in what we do. And I always, that story always stays with me. There's more. I won't go into all the detail, but just. That, that's a phenomenal story because what I'm hearing from that, right? That That's just one story you're sharing. But what I'm hearing is that what Silverado does is that what each resident receives is unique to them, right? And what they need in their experience. And when you're describing this gentleman, right? So I'm uh, still in the military right now, but I've always firmly believed that veterans have a different end of life experience, especially the older generations, right? Because it used to be taboo to talk about your stuff. Now with the, the current generation, right? They encourage, talk about it. You know, PTSD is no longer, you know, something that's taboo. But these older generations, when they came home, they, they didn't really talk about this stuff, right? They just went on with their lives. But the issue, I think, and this is why I think veterans have a, de a different end of life experience is because maybe the 
memories or post-traumatic stress from what they endured. I mean, think about World War II in Korea, Vietnam, even now I'm seeing more Vietnam veterans as clients. Once they develop some sort of cognitive disease, their ability to suppress and control their PTSD is now minimized. And so you have these situations where people like this gentleman you shared, right, going into communities and getting kicked out because maybe they're having some sort of PTSD moment. Well, Sarah, first and foremost, as I've always said to you, thank you for your service uh, with great respect. Oh. What, no, I, I say that, believe me, having family members that served both from World War II all the way through into Korea, um, in into Vietnam. So um, number one, number two, you hit the nail on the head with that again, very respectfully spoken. I, I really think that what we find in our communities, sometimes when people refer to us and a lot of them have a different model, there's beautiful communities out there, but when they refer and we bring them in, in our Silverado world, we try to step back and go, okay, we do this, but it's the way we guide them down. It's about how do we redirect? It's about understanding who they are. I got to share this I, and forgive me. I'll be. No, please. We, we, there is no time limit. There's, there's no time limit. I, you know, before you share this, I just, I urge the audience to think about these elder veterans, right? Imagine how scary it yeah. must be for them. They can't control it, right? They have dementia, they have yeah. Alzheimer's, right? But all of a sudden they're starting to feel like they're back, you know, in Korea <laughs> or, you know, or, you know, not as many these days, but 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 imagine how they're feeling when they have these moments that they can't control anymore. It's got to be scary. Well, let me just say this back to your very good point. When we bring them in, I mean, we we had a gentleman transition recently, but um, we do have one gentleman in one of our communities, World War II veteran, um, which it's amazing. And of course, God bless that population is most of them in their 90s and, and above. But we understand, we want to understand who they are and then give purpose to whatever activities they can engage in to understand how we can navigate each day to give them purpose and hope as much as one can. And that is a key, especially with our veterans. So we have many veterans throughout our communities nationally, but it goes back to the very foundation of, let me understand who John is. Let me understand who Bob is. Let me understand who Richard is. Let's take them down that path. Because a lot of times those agitations it's untying those knots to let them feel free in their purpose and they enjoy things and maybe they're making things or they're part of the walking club or even if it's part of our internal support groups within our communities. It's all these little things that add up. The other story I wanted to mention to you happened about five years ago. We had a gentleman agitated, you know, was ready to swing at a caregiver or two along the way. Mm -hmm. Want to understand who he was. So we found out along the lines he loved baseball. I always remember this. So we had one of our male caregivers at the time. I'm coming into the community and I hear him talking about baseball. And I'm old enough to remember baseball back in the 60s when I was little and all that. So I was, oh, well, you know, moisturizing creams. I don't know. God love you. That's just the number. That's what my family says. My dad says. Uh, but so he was talking and he says, uh, well, yeah, I saw the game too. I can't believe that Bud Harrelson flew out. And then it started to occur to me this caregiver, and I didn't know this, he was like his own baseball historian. He loved baseball. He was able to pull a conversation back, and he was talking about the 1969 Mets in their run to the pennant. And the resident was like, yeah, I couldn't believe it. But when he got the hit and he was getting excited, and it was a moment, and it was a moment where I was just, and I talked to him afterwards. I go, man, that was amazing. And he goes, man, he goes, I was just, you know, doing what we do. He goes, you're a great caregiver, but that to me, that was a wow. But it was, he goes, yeah, Rick, he goes, but it made uh, Stephen happy. It, it brought him where he needed to be. And to me, that's one thing that we do at Silverado. And I encourage every community digging in deep to who they are to lay that foundation of happiness, which goes back to, we can make this work, but we got to work together from soup to nuts, from caregiver to the front desk. Absolutely. Absolutely. Gosh, there's just so many powerful stories. Um, okay. I'm going to move forward and ask this question. We're going to have to get you on here again. So you can just share stories. It's so moving and so powerful. <laughs> All right. What are you seeing right now as we move forward mm -hmm. that are the biggest concerns for families as they look at the best options for their loved one? 
I think the biggest thing, and I'm again, I see the sunlight shining. So again, timing to this wonderful time with you today. Um, I think the biggest thing is the concern for families is the safety piece for their loved one. Um, I'm getting ready to place my loved one. What does it look like in your community? What are the protocols that you have in place? And I think that is something that as people evaluate communities out there, what are those protocols? What are you doing? How are you doing it? Um, you know, I think obviously if you're in a memory care industry, you got to have some protocols. And obviously we take our information from the CDC in our world. Uh, so very self-aware, you know, at this point, you know, mask on in the community environment. Um, certainly if we're in a place where, you know, doors closed, have a little lunch, okay, mask mm -hmm. back on and we will follow that. But I think what I see is families are starting to come out, but they want to feel real confident that the protocols are good. I think also too, the biggest thing for families, as much as they also want to know that, they also want to be able to know they can still spend time with their loved one. And that's a big one right now. And I got to tell you, props to our Silverado communities nationally, and certainly the ones I represent here in San Diego. They have done such an incredible job of coordinating lunches, visits outside, making sure all those protocols are in place so they can spend that half hour, that hour of time and really organizing that. So our directors of engagement, our social worker, working with the families, communication. So families want to know, okay, I agree that Silverado could be the right place. I'm ready to release to this great community, but I still want to have a relationship with my loved one. And the other thing is not just have a relationship with my loved one where I could physically be, but I have a sister in Texas and a brother in the state of Washington. What does that look like? And so putting a plan together going, you know, great question, Sarah. So we're going to make sure that every Wednesday at two, we do a Zoom call and bring everybody together so you can see, you know, your dad and your you sister. You guys do that? Like, oh, yeah. They they that level where you're like when you talk to the family and they make the decision, you're saying, how are we going to continually involve the family in engaging their loved one? Like, that to me is absolutely critical because think about it, Sarah, and just put this in your mind. Think of your loved one, your family, and you could be grandpa, grandpa, whoever it is, a loved one, mom, dad. And I go, okay, Sarah, well, we're going to take care of your loved one. We've got this. We'll check back with you in a couple of weeks. Maybe we'll send you a picture. You're like, wait a minute, time out. I need to have a warm, safe game plan, for lack of a better term, that's going to give me peace of mind, not just today, but tomorrow, but also know they're getting that quality of life, but also that I can feel that sense of connection, especially if that's your spouse. So we look at every individual plan, our social workers involved, family ambassadors involved, our director of health services involved. And what they do is they have, they do what we call a, a family planning meeting or a post meeting after this is what we're going to do to find the expectation going forward, understanding who their loved one is and coordinating the events. And we did a lot of that even during COVID because we did still bring in people, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. even though the COVID component was there, we mm -hmm. navigated in to give them that because it looked very different last mm -hmm. year. Now it's starting to open up. So I think for families and especially as you look at communities, understand their medical model, understand the safety protocols, understand the things that will give you that peace of mind. And, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, different sites you can look about, look on online to do that. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that at the end here, but making sure the things you can even Google the things you need to know when you go into a community and Google that it, the internet is a library of information. And um, I can certainly send you a, a, a document that we have again, may not be the right fit, but it could be a document that they can use as they evaluate a community that's appropriate for their loved one, whether or not it's Silverado or another place. So I'm going to say this to the audience, and I very much believe this. When you go to Google and you start looking this stuff up, which you should do, I don't, don't, just put your information in or, or work with a company who's going to give you a list of communities and say, Oh, well here, th these are your options. I really encourage you to reach out to somebody like Rick, right? Somebody who is going to be 
holding your hand through the process and really getting to know you to make sure that you make the correct choice from the beginning. Because if you are just getting a list of communities um, and you make the decision yourself without professional guidance, you know, it, it's less likely that it's going to be the right fit. So imagine this, right? You're trying to find a community for your loved one. It's already traumatic for them to, to leave the home. And so if you put them in one community and it's not the right fit, and then you have to put them in another community, you're compounding on the trauma. So I really think it's important to reach out to somebody like Rick, whether Silverado is the right fit or not, he has already shared that he will guide you. But don't, don't go the route of getting just a list of communities, right? Um, I think I said that okay. <laughs> Well, Sarah, first of all, I, I appreciate that. And, and let me echo, um, again, I have these conversations every day with, with families, a lot of community partners that look at us as a resource as well. My goal and focus every day, my passion is, what can I do that's going to give you the peace of mind? What can we do that's going to get you where you need to be? Sometimes we're not the right fit. We understand the money component, but if we can give guidance or guide to a partner or just give them a, a path that will help them in their journey, both through their own well-being of health, taking care of themselves. Those are the things that I share with people and you eloquently said it. And, you know, I mean, just touching on different sites, I actually wrote a couple down. Um, there's a site on aarp.org um, forward slash caregiving uh, forward slash life balance. It's a great site. It's got a lot of really good information. Again, life balance, um, going to caregiverstress.com and understanding within that, where am I? Am I doing good? Is there signs I need to be aware of? My wife tells me that she sees it and I deny it. But if I go in there and say, wait a minute, maybe some of this is going on, you need to be checking with you to be the best version of you as you go forward. So um, yeah, I just want to, you know, heart and soul, I just mm -hmm. want us all to do what we need to do for each other and mm -hmm. do what we need to do to support those that we love. And if we can help along the way, then we're honored to do so. Definitely. Okay. Last question. I understand uh, Silverado just celebrated 24 years. Okay. So serving those with Alzheimer's and dementia, what do you think it's about your core philosophy that has guided caregivers and family members in choosing Silverado for their loved one? You know, I will echo back what I said earlier. Um, proud to be a part of the journey the last 10 um, again the model that was built I think it really goes to a core philosophy of giving each individual that walks through the door uh, purpose life engagement celebrating them um, I think the mindset that Lauren and Steve and Jim started in 96 is just echoed for going on 25 years next year, which we'll celebrate proudly. Um, I think it's understanding each individual when they come in, who are they? What was part of their journey in life and how can we bring that purpose within the community environment, whatever that is, how active they might've been. Like, great, we're gonna have Julia teach a Spanish class because she was a teacher or have, uh, you know, Stephanie become a, uh, you know, uh, a teacher within Teach Zumba and get up there with our instructors, understanding all those different things. I think the core philosophy is also bringing life through our different programs, you know, that we do, which is so critical through the Nexus program. And again, the biggest thing is, you know, what, what touches their heart? And then guiding them through those activities or having movie nights where we're all together and watching them sit there watching a Top Gun movie and seeing them dancing or <laughs> listening to music when it's the movie starting. The little thing <laughs> that we do or it's making things. I have one of my communities makes bracelets. I have these incredible women that make bracelets, taking those out to the community. It's great and it's impactful. But you know what's great is the purpose behind it. So when I talk core philosophy, I talk about a world-class organization that the philosophy that Silverado has always had is good is the enemy of great. Great is about the impact that we make on these people every day, their families, their stories. And when I tell you, I, I'll tell you, I, I relish the moment because we didn't do it last year where I get back to see all of my, my associates across the country, probably in 2022, where we celebrate those stories and we do celebrate them. And I'm reminded 
of the impact that Silverado continues to make. And, you know, I'll tell you, Sarah, I don't know what the future holds, but I, I hope as my story continues that I can continue to have an impact on those that I touch and have an impact in Silverado until I'm ready to say it's time to close up the planner and uh, give the baton to somebody new and continue to make an impact. But I hope that gives you a little perspective. But I yeah. um, I am so appreciative that, that we had the time to talk today um, for a couple of reasons, right? The, the information and the stories are so powerful and I feel like the community um, needs to hear these, right? Whether it's the family or there's, you know, maybe some advisors that, that have watched today that have clients and they need to provide options. Um, but also I learned so much more about Silverado, uh, that I, that I didn't know <laughs> from before. So I'm, I'm really moved by the philosophy and how you guys are serving people. Um, so Rick, if, if somebody wants to learn more, sure. how can they contact you? Yeah, you bet. I'm pretty simple. Um, I say two different ways. Um, you can call me, text me. Uh, my number, uh, which is great, is uh, 760-215-5517. Uh, I can also be reached via email at R, first initial, last name Topetti, T-O-P-E-T-E, -E, at silverado.com. Um, and, you know, whatever I can do to guide, I, I would also say uh, feel free to Google Silverado Memory Care Irvine and you can then, you know, forward slash Escondido or Encinitas or wherever you may be and whatever part of the country you may be, it will give you all of our locations. But if I can help guide or assist, it'll be my honor, Sarah, and really just truly appreciate you giving me this platform today to speak a little bit about what we do and hopefully maybe some perspective that will help some caregivers out there in their journey and serving their loved ones as well. Definitely. Um, so I want to encourage the audience, like whether, and this is what I, what I feel about you, Rick, right? You're saying I'm going to guide whether they want to place their mom or dad or not, or they just want to understand options. Like you're willing to take your time and just have a conversation regardless if they're going to place their loved one, regardless if it's Silverado, you're saying, just let me be here for you and, and offer some clarity in your, in your journey right now as the family caregiver. Is that correct? Absolutely. And like I said, certainly down here in the San Diego County, um, I have uh, an amazing team behind me. So if there's guidance beyond myself that we can assist you with, or some of my other community partners, I will absolutely guide, uh, navigate and assist any way I can. And if we're the right fit, great. Again, if there's other alternatives we can assist with, it'll be our great honor to do so, which is why we're doing this, right? Well, I, otherwise, why am I here, right? I respect <laughs> to you and to all those wonderful people out there to serve. Awesome. Thank you so much for being my guest today. Um, go ahead. I think this was great, Sarah. I really, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much and just wish you a, a great rest of day and look forward to our next communication here real soon. Me too. Um, as a reminder, uh, Connect Our Elders, entire intention is to empower the aging process. And the way that we do that is through uh, education around all of the different elder care resources, uh, navigation through those resources so that way you can feel empowered in making your decision and then ongoing advocacy. Thank you for tuning in today and I will see you soon.